Once upon a time, two friends joined forces to bring you the best in horror entertainment. Brian from the north, Tim from the south, each bringing their own unique perspective to the horror community. Movie reviews, Blu-ray releases, beer pairings, games, and more. Welcome to your new home for horror. This is Civil Gore. Hey there, everybody. Welcome to Civil Gore Podcast. I'm your host, Tim. And this is Brian, and we are back for VHS Part 2, the second kind of like trilogy, I guess, although it may not be a trilogy anymore because of the new one, but we don't know if that new one is going to start its own little three little segments of this, but I feel like the, 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 these three kind of go together well, nicely, 94, 99, and, yeah. and 85. Because they're like the year, this is like the year trilogy. Yeah. And uh, I'm hoping, I'm hoping, kind of, I'm hoping the new one, since it broke from the year format, is starting a new trilogy of maybe themed entries. Like, because the next entry is going to be sci fi based. So maybe it's going to kick off a whole new themed entry. I don't yeah. know. We'll have to see. Time will tell. Uh, but yes, we are covering VHS 94, VHS 99, and VHS 85, which are our most current three uh, entries in the franchise before the new one comes out in October. Uh, which we'll probably do a bonus episode on that one just to just to catch back up. So if you listen to part one of this uh, Summer for Slaycation last week, we covered uh, the first three movies of the franchise and we ranked our favorite segments. So we ranked all the segments within each movie. And at the end of this episode, we're going to rank the entire franchise, our favorite films, uh, how we rank them uh, all six uh, in terms of what we like best. So to kick things off, we have VHS 94. This one came out quite a bit after VHS Viral. VHS Viral was 2014. It took seven years before they came out with VHS 94 because VHS Viral just was not that great. Kind of uh, killed the franchise for a few years until VHS 94 just valiantly resurrected it. I thought it did a a kind of a brilliant job uh, bringing it back. It kind of came out of nowhere, too. (laughs) <laughs> it really did yeah i'd all like basically written this franchise off uh when this came out some great directors here we had uh, the empty wake directed by simon barrett uh the veggie masher directed by steven kostansky uh storm drain directed by chloe okuno terror directed by ryan prowls uh, holy hell uh which was the wraparound directed by jennifer reader and the subject directed by timo Tiai. Tia Yanto. I said that right. The, I think you corrected me the last time I said that name. I probably butchered it the first time around. Yeah, I think that Veggie Masher, by the way, is just a, a small commercial thing in it. It's not a true. Um, it is. It's yes, not a, yes, a full it segment. Is. It's a very, um, so the synopsis here is a police SWAT team investigate a mysterious VHS tape and discover a sinister cult that has pre recorded material which uncovers a nightmarish conspiracy. Uh, again, As with all the VHS wraparounds, uh, they're kind of forgettable in terms of being like a full, complete story. They're kind of, uh, I mean, they're fine in terms of what they do to to kind of keep the movie flowing. But uh, this one, again, I I didn't even register for me. Even after I rewatched it, I couldn't have told you what this wraparound was about. Yeah, it's definitely ambitious, this one, but it's still like kind of confusing. Like most of these, these, I, I wish they would cut back on the ambition to reduce the complexity because I think they're so ambitious. They're to just come off confusing because as a wraparound, you're getting broken up so much that it's hard to follow the through line of a complex wraparound when it's constantly being interrupted by other segments. Yeah. I just wish they would stop making these so complicated. The synopsis here though, is um, a woman dressed in white clothing inhales a gas of vapor being emitted by a gelatinous white substance on her hands. Later, She has her eyes gouged out. A SWAT team comes in, raids this warehouse, believing it's a drug bust. They find a private jet behind the warehouse. Then you hear this woman like speaking, all are welcome, all are watching. Finally, followers, tonight is the night you've been waiting for. Track my signal. So it's like something with this this substance is something with some kind of cult. Mm -hmm. Uh, They discover all these prison cell light rooms with television sets displaying static. People have their eyes gouged out and the drug the drug or substance or whatever is dripping onto the floor. If you can make sense of that, what I just told you, then more power to you. I couldn't make a bit of sense. Yeah. And that one also kind of blended with one of the, the, the segments to where I thought it was part of, I got got confused that subject said thing. I thought was connected to this wraparound at one point. Yeah, It's confusing. Yeah. Um, The first one is one of my all time favorite segments of the entire franchise. This is storm drain Uh, in Westerville, Ohio channel six news reporter, Holly Marciano and her cameraman, Jeff are filming a story about the rat man, a cryptid of local legend who has supposedly been living in the town storm drains. 
After interviewing several of the town citizens who have reportedly witnessed the creature to gain information, the duo descend into a storm drain where they find several homeless encampments. While filming, they are approached by a man covered in black slime. Holly tries to interview him, but when he begins to spit up black liquid and murmurs Ratma, they attempt to flee. Before they can make their escape, they are captured by other residents of the sewers. I remember when, when this came, when I watched this the first time, I was so excited because I was like, this is VHS is back. This is awesome. I love this segment. It's still one of my yeah. favorite segments. It's probably my, it might be my favorite segment to be quite honest, but it, it's, it's at least number two behind safe. Hit. Yeah, no. And this one spawned like, Oh my God, how many hail Ratma like memes and stuff were going around. Yeah. This was all yeah. over Twitter because yeah. this was when like, right when like, I feel like Jeff Whitmire was at a strength of his Twitter thing and he was hail Ratma to everybody. Yeah. And it was great because it was like such a, uh, like, first of all, you and I like cryptids. Second of all, it kind of like, you didn't expect it to be what, what it was. And it just was, you know, and it's just like a whole like a very like surprising segment because I didn't I wasn't sure what they were going to go for. Like if it was going to be one of these things where they weren't going to find anything. It was just going to end with a like a like a like a shot or something. But it continued when you didn't expect yeah. it to in a good way. Unlike some of the other segments where you just wanted it to end. This one just kept going and had a like one of the like a, a shocking ending that you did not expect to go on. And it was just kind of gave me a little shining vibes there. Uh, and it was just like I, that shining. I'm sorry, howling. Where did I get shining? Howling um, at the end <laughs> there. Um, and so it was like it got. Uh, it just it was super like it's just super fun segment. Like like basically, I don't think they could have picked a better segment to welcome you back into the VHS franchise than this because this kind of had the same kind of feeling that like that the first segment of the original movie had where it was like this really cool like wow we're gonna get something awesome now i can't wait i'm back you know we're back on board like they this in this one this was the perfect segment to open the the new vhs uh age here so to speak yeah i agree and brian and i uh, all of our rankings agreed on this movie uh we we both ranked yeah. this one number one <laughs> we actually ranked, ranked all of ours the, uh, the same on this one um but brian take the next one because the next one is also a favorite favorite of mine yeah, I love this one. Um, this one's called The Empty Wake. It says, at Jensen Funeral Home, a young woman named Haley is assigned to host a wake for a, f- a man named Andrew Edwards, whose family has requested the service be video recorded during the whole night. Which I didn't patch that line, I guess, a couple. I think that's a couple of times I watched that segment. I don't think I caught it the first time that they requested the video, but like that makes sense now. Uh, it says, Haley's boss, Ronald, and another assistant, Tim. Tim. I was there. (laughs) Leave the building. Yeah, I didn't realize you were there. Uh, Leave the building for the night, leaving Haley to pass the time reading. A strong thunderstorm begins outside, causing the power to flicker. Haley then calls her friend Sharon, asking for her to check the local obituaries for Andrew's name. When she hears strange noises from the casket, which is moved on the beer, I guess that's that. The stand. The table it's on. Yeah, the stand. Yep. Haley calls Tim and says she thinks Andrew may still be alive. Tim calls the worries by explaining the body most likely releases gases that are causing the noises. Uh, The storm worsens, begins uh, building to an occasionally lose power. Strange man who identifies himself as Gustav and claims to be a relative of Andrew arrives at the wake during which Haley allows him to pay his respects. After uttering an apparent incantation in Hungarian, Gustav thanks Haley for the opportunity and abruptly leaves. And that's kind of where you know that's the good detail but what so i have to say what i this one was so creepy just on the basis of it like funeral homes creepy to begin with when they're filled with people mm-hmm. let alone being trapped there overnight in the middle of a storm to the point where a creepy hungarian man actually gives you a little bit of comfort like yes. okay this is she's not being trapped in there someone showed up for this week you know kind of thing and it's it's funny too because you know you always hear that thing where people are like embalmers and they 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 you know you'll, you'll hear the gaseous cell and they'll you know it sounds like the the dead body's alive. But what I did not expect is to where it went, where literally the body comes out. And spoiler alerts, by the way, sorry. Um, the body comes out and is like missing the, the half of his head, which is so creepy to me for some reason. It was so well done. Yeah. It's so well done. I remember when I first saw this segment, I was completely blown away by the effects of this. Like, yeah. it, it completely blew me away. I was like jaw on the floor watching this and, and it was it just seared itself into my brain. Like like you said, the, the fact that it was during a, it was in a funeral home, the way it was filmed with the storm outside, and then she's like basically like flashlight. You're just seeing a flashlight on the coffin and everything. It was so creepily done. It looked it already yeah. set the tone. And then to have this thing coming out and it looks so realistic because 
Yeah. You're you're filming this low light with the flashlight, and then you have this like amazing effect that that doesn't look like it should be able to be filmed in found footage uh, coming at you. It just oh man, it was it was wonderful. I, it was so 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 well done. Uh, this one, again, this one is one of my favorite segments, even though I ranked it number two because Ratma, all hell Ratma, you can't you can't rank anything over Ratma. But uh, this one definitely strong runner yeah. up for my favorite segment. Yeah, no, if Ratma was not on there, this would be total number one. Yeah, for sure. Oh yeah, if Ratma was not on here, this this would be easily number one. Yeah, and uh, like the, just the sequence of like where that like they literally the guy like she realizes that he can't see because he's got no eyeballs, but yet she finds the remains of the head. Like on the floor, like the other piece of the yeah. head. Yeah, they show the other piece on the floor. And then basically the eyes spotted, so the body then, oh my God, it just was so cool. It was like such a creepy and like almost like com- like somewhat comedic if it wasn't so damn creepy. But it was, oh, it was just really good overall. Yeah, it, w- it was wonderful. Uh, the next se- segment is the subject. Somewhere in Indonesia, a man wakes up to find his body gone and replaced by mechanical spider legs. He falls from his restraints and catches fire, which is soon extinguished by Dr. James Suhendra, a deranged scientist who desires to create a successful mechanical human hybrid using kidnapped humans as guinea pigs. He carries out a lobotomy on a young woman with the initials SA, referred to as Subject 99, using a circular saw, and sedates a restrained young man, referred to as Subject 98, after he wakes up early. Both experiments are successful. Subject 98 becomes a large robot with spring-powered blades for arms, and SA becomes a functioning cyborg that responds to speech. Um, this one, I'll tell you, I really like this segment. But and the effects were just phenomenal in this one. But it was another one that I think suffered from being too long. I, I got yeah. the premise and it just kind of went. I think they could have done with like just one subject. Yeah. And it had been fine. But they went on and had to do two subjects. And it just it, it went longer than it probably needed to be. And I think that's where this one killed it for me and, and dropped it down to my number three ranking. But it, it's a good segment. It's just too long. Like like we've seen in some previous entries. Yeah, they could have chopped about like five to ten minutes out of the middle of it and probably would have been fine. Like, you know, like there was just a lot of repetitive mm-hmm. of the, the cyborg killing the agents coming in. And I, I, it kind of picked up again, though. That's why I'm like saying from the middle segment, because I picked up where that one soldier was like trying to save the subject, realized showing the empathy for it. But I mean, the, the segment itself is kind of cool because it's kind of creepy to think. Imagine waking up. And like you being like half cyborg like that, I mean that's got to be, you know, kind of terrifying for the person. So I kind of like that they went that way, but you know. Yeah, I like the like there was a scene where like the the girl looks in the mirror and she sees what she's become, and you just think like what would you, like you can't undo that. Yeah, you know you're you're stuck like that. You can't go forward living like that, but you can't undo what's been done to you. Like it'd be a horrible situation to find yourself in. So I did. I enjoyed the creepiness of it, but again, just suffered from being too long. Yeah, I think sometimes some of these directors get so enamored with their effects that they forget to trim and edit. <laughs> yeah, I, I think you're. <laughs> yeah, I know. I think you're exactly right. Um, the final segment uh, yeah. is uh, the first Patriots movement. Uh, sorry, it's called Terror, and it's the First Patriots Movement Militia are a white supremacist extremist group that are currently plotting to blow up a local government building in a bid to take back America. This one is just all too real right now. <laughs> uh, it is Yes, all too yeah, real. That's why I like this segment was going to be ranked for automatically just for me. It's it's too real right now. <laughs> um, yeah. It is shown that they live in a well-secured compound at, at in a deserted area somewhere in Detroit, Michigan. The compound has room for security cameras as well as a heavily protected small room covered in wooden crosses. The latter room, a man is chained up and kept prisoner. Bob, the group's cameraman, Greg, the group leader, and Chuck, a group member, enter the room. The man pleads for his life, and Greg shoots in point-blank range. Film cuts to one of those group propaganda videos where Greg explains that the group intends to purge evil from America. And there's kind of your setup for it. And it's – I mean, it's funny. When this came out, um, it was right at the time uh, where, you know, we had experienced already – right? I mean, this came out after January 6th, right? When this came out, yeah, yeah. yeah so I mean, I we've so. all seen yeah. it. We've all seen this. Uh, not to go into this politics or anything, but you know, you, you, we've seen these play out in real life. So it's, um, you know, they yes, they added a horror element to it, but still, I think it's a little too raw and real right now to be like yeah. almost like you know, it's like all right, you almost it almost makes it like do I I don't even want to see this in a movie anymore, you know, because we see it outside too much. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, it's good effects, but they even take away the element that it's like hits too close to home. It's it's not a very good segment. 
like it's, it doesn't yeah. have much of a plot. It's just like show up at this militia group and watch people shoot each other. I mean, it's, I, I just felt it was a weak segment in yeah. general. And I, again, I don't know why they insist on ending the, these movies on a weak segment. Like, why would yeah. you do that? It, this one should have been towards the front. This one actually would have worked better as a wraparound in my opinion. Yeah, they don't all do it at least. At least yeah, uh, one but... of the ones coming up ends on a good note. But um, yeah, this one yeah, this one just uh, – it was a bad – like especially because the first two were so great and the third one was good. And then to – now yeah. to then just drop off so significantly to the – like you dropped like levels. Like I yeah. wish I could have made this five almost. <laughs> but there's no fourth segment. Yeah, it's too uh. bad because – this is this is one of my favorite entries in the entire franchise, VHS ninety four. Yeah. Um, and I think this one like holds it back from being truly, truly great. I think this this one segment really holds yeah. it back. Um, next up was VHS ninety nine. This one came out a year later uh, in twenty twenty two. So Ozzy's Dungeon was directed by Flying Lotus, uh, Shredding by Maggie Levin, who we've had on before, uh, The Gawkers by Tyler McIntyre, uh, Suicide Bid by Johannes Roberts, uh, and To Hell and Back by uh, Joseph Winter and Vanessa Winter. So um, this one does not have a wraparound. This is the this one was the one we mentioned that does not have a wraparound. It just has a clips of a kid making home stop motion home movies with toy soldiers, which will, will later lead into one of the segments that you realize is is part of one of the segments. But it's not a true wraparound. It's just a kind of a filler. The uh, first uh, segment here is called shredding. R-A-C-K is an acronym for members Rachel, Uncle, Chris, and Caleb are a punk rock band who love pulling pranks and regularly record their antics on a web show that they host. For their latest video, the band decides to break into the Colony Underground, a former music venue that burned down three years prior in an electrical fire which claimed the lives of all four members of the punk band Bitch Cat who died after being trampled during a chaotic stampede. Um, this one, I rank this one number four. It's not a terrible segment, but... I think compared to like some of the other things, it's just not as memorable. So I just, I don't know. I had to put this one down towards the bottom. I didn't rank it dead last, but, uh, and I probably in hindsight, I think I might've agreed with Brian on this one. I ranked it last over the one I actually did rank last, but yeah, I feel bad too, because I love Maggie Levin and, and you know, all her other stuff we, she's done is great. I think it's just, I, I didn't, I don't know. Something about the the peop, the characters in this just annoyed the hell out of me. Yeah, they're not very likable. Yeah, and so it's like to me, I'm like, ugh. you know, I'm like, I'm like, I like, and I thought it was a little predictable. Like you knew what was going to happen, and I just wanted it to get to that point already. I felt like I'm like, I hate these people. I want them. They, I know this band is going to come back and kill them. Just come back and kill them already. I, you know, I can't. They they were like annoying to me. I don't know. But I, but I will say it's well done yeah. because Maggie Levin has a, an incredibly good style of filmmaking. So, so it's like I, I mean, any I have a feeling anyone else would have done it. It would have been an an unmitigated disaster. I think because she's so talented that it it saved it honestly. But I still had to rank it five, unfortunately. <laughs> it, and again, I, I don't think any of these are bad no. segments. Really, uh, they're they're just you ha you have to rank them compared to the other segments in the movie. So yeah, I mean, something's got to be five. Something's got to be one. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so Brian, you've got next one, suicide bid. Yes, suicide bid. It says college freshman Lily is desperate to join Beta Sigma Eta, the most prestigious sorority on her campus. Lily performs a suicide bid, only applying to one sorority as her recruitment choice, risking potential alienation upon rejection. The efforts pay off as Lily is invited for a night on the town with Beta Sigma Eta sisters. The sisters, headed by Annie, take Lily to a nearby graveyard where, as part of a hazing ritual, she is dared to spend the night buried inside a coffin. The sisters uh, reveal that this is meant to recreate an urban legend wherein another freshman, Guiltine, which I think is one of the coolest sounding names for like a haunted lore ever, Guiltine. That just sounds so perfect. Yeah. Um, was dared to commit the same deed to enter the same sorority 20 years earlier, only to be forgotten by her classmates for weeks. She was found to have vanished from the coffin, was unearthed, rumored to have crawled into the underworld. I see what you mean on your, your thing. It, yeah, it is like right after the, the last one. It's kind of similar in plot. But I really like this one more because of the, the – I love the fact that, like, you know, a lot of it took place trapped in a coffin. I love that guillotine name. I think that is, like, pure gold in terms of a name for uh, for what happened in this. And I like the twist, kind of like the twist at the end. Um, I thought it was, yeah, and I just thought it was, it was just 
it was just well done overall, I think. But again, there was other ones that were better in this. Like this one had like pretty much every one was like a solid segment in a in its own way. So yeah, I rank, so you ranked this one number four. I ranked it number three. Um, the reason I had it ranked a little bit higher, I think, is because I am so scared to death of like being buried alive. Like that's a big fear. And so to me, that really was effective in this one because I could just feel that claustrophobia. But I do think this one suffered, like you said, from being so close to the first one because both of them featured like these undead zombie looking resurrected corpses. It, to me, it would be like if in uh, Creep Show, if you had done the Father's Day segment, which is the first segment, and then you'd immediately done the Ted Danson segment with the water zombies, like right after. It's like, well, don't put two zombie segments right beside each other. I, who orders these things? Like, I wish I could just sit down and go, wait, don't do that. Like, put this one. You could have flipped this one with the next segment, which is Ozzy's Dungeon or any of them, really. And and, and it would have been a better fit because you would have had some separation. But coming yeah. right off on the heels of that, it just was like the same creature again. And yeah. I think that really suffered, it made it suffer. I still ranked it number three um, because I had another one ranked farther down. Yeah, well, you would have died, too, because Emily's Halloween party, she had that uh, she had that thing set up where this this actual like really cool sound designer uh made this whole sound thing where you get into a coffin and you'd hear like the like the dirt being buried on top of you oh, in there yeah. and this whole thing and then when you hear the sound you you can come out again um it was really it was cool with that and then didn't we do was it wasn't we did chris rankin did it that coffin ride in wilmington the coffin time? ride yeah he went, yeah 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 so those kind of things are kind of kind of fun um, yeah. Oh, you you have the next one, actually. Yeah, the n- next one is Ozzy's Dungeon. Ozzy's Dungeon is a children's game show where young contestants participate in physical challenges for a chance to descend into the titular dungeon and meet Ozzy, who will allow the winner to be granted a wish. During Ozzy's orifices, the enthusiastic Donna, whose wish is to help her poverty-stricken family leave their rundown neighborhood, is brutally injured by her rival contestant, Timmy, losing the show. I'm everywhere in this region. Uh, losing the yeah, show you after really the host are. doesn't stop. Losing the show after the host doesn't stop the game so her injury can be properly tended to. Years later, after Ozzy's Dungeon was canceled, the show's former host awakened, stripped and locked in a dog cage in the basement of Donna's domineering mother, Deborah, who was gradually revealed to have groomed her daughter to win the show at all costs so she could escape Detroit. With the help of her browbeaten husband, Marcus, their son, Brandon, and permanently crippled Donna, who now uses a wheelchair and whose injured leg is decaying and gangrenous, Deborah has the host filmed while he is forced through several torturous versions of the obstacles from the show threatening to douse him with acid if he refuses to comply. He fails to complete the course by seconds. The host offers to bring the family to Ozzy and have their wish granted. Okay, so I ranked this one my last, and it probably doesn't deserve to be last, but I I did not... I love the first part of this where they were doing... It was basically a Double Dare parody. Yeah. And if you guys remember Double Dare on Nickelodeon, it was a kid's game show where they did all these like sliding down sides full of slime and trying to find flags and a big pool of mashed potatoes or whatever it was. I love double dare. I was, I was like all the kids of the nineties. I watched it. Um, but I, I love the first part where they were parroting that. Cause I thought it was hilarious. It was like a really nostalgic look back, but I, I, for so, I just didn't care for it when it switched over to the torture part. Like it, it turned me off. I didn't like it. And that's why I ended up ranking this with number five. I kind of appreciate the story was kind of cool, but, the torture stuff. I don't know. I guess I don't have the patience for that anymore. Yeah, it, it was it was rough to see that. And and, you know, and Sonya Eddy though did a great job. Sadly, she I realized she passed away recently. I didn't realize that when I was doing research. And oh, she was I in something else that. we just yeah. watched that was really good. Uh, she's yeah, she's really good. And I felt bad that she played the mom in that, and she she passed away sadly. Um, what, what I thought would have been like it's funny as you were saying that I was thinking you're it's like a very stark thing. It goes from like this almost like comical bizarro even though it's tragic it's just like it's almost like this over the top dark comedy in the fir- first part and then the second one is like really extra bleak even though i i think they tried to capture the same tone what they almost should have done is almost like gone flip back and forth or something like maybe like gone back and forth to the two things that simultaneously and then have yeah. that that ending uh tacked uh, put on there but i still liked it because i uh, the same re- the same reason you did i love double dare growing up and we, we actually had the home game do you remember that you could buy the home sets of double dare where it would have like yeah. stuff and yeah. it was just like it was such a phenomenon for our our thing and we always want who didn't want to be on that show you know so it, it's i, I kind of like the way they did that yeah i I, I like the premise. I just, uh, I think 
I think the, the, the contrast of tone was just too sharp for me. Like it went from like dark comedy, funny, nostalgic to like torture porn. I, I was, I couldn't, couldn't handle that transition there. Yeah. It's torture uh, porn stuff. Yeah. So <laughs> I ranked it number, I, I ranked it last and, and Brian ranked it third, but I could see mine going up. I could, I could put it up a little bit more. I think if you ask me on a different day. Yeah. Next one is our, well, I, I, spoiler alert, I ranked this number one. Uh, you can call us biased, but we, we you know, our, our good friend Emily stars in this one. Um, and this one is called The Gawkers. Uh, and it's Brady is a young teenager who films stop motion videos of toy soldiers, which is what's in the segment, which is essentially the wraparound, which was kind of funny. You didn't realize that until uh, later, but um, yeah. he does it with his older brother, Dylan Cameron. While Brady records his latest video, Dylan bursts into his room and takes the camera, which he uses to film himself practicing pickup lines. He and his friends, Kurt, Mark and Boner. Did, why does everyone have a friend named Boner somewhere in these things? You know, it's like uh, exclude Brady from their activities, right? Wasn't it? What was it? Was it? Um, Growing Pains had Boner, like in it. Was it Growing Pains? Yeah, it might have been Growing Pains. I know. I remember Boner in one of those eighty sitcoms for sure. It was yeah. Was it that or Family Matter? I don't know. One of them had, but, but the guy's name was something, and they called him Boner, which I was surprised was on network television. But <laughs> anyway, um. Uh, oh, sorry. The friends then go out to pull pranks on the neighborhood residents and each other and perform tricks at the local skate park. A little flashback to the uh, the, the bone saw segment or whatever that was. Or bone bone saw was it bone? Oh, yeah. Uh, the group discovers. A, okay, well, let me get up to the uh, to the part where the actual plot is. Okay, so after concealing the camera, using it to attempt to get a secret upskirt photos of two girls, the team becomes fixated on Sandra, an attractive blonde who has moved into the house across the street from Brady and Dylan's house and whose yard is decorated with several stone busts. As if boys film her washing her car from Brady's window, they are interrupted by a delivery man who hands Sandra a computer. Brady later meets and befriends Sandra who invites him to her house while he attempts to roller skate, much to Dylan's shock and jealousy. Upon Brady's return, Kurt, Mark, and Boner compliment him for his newfound relationship with Sandra. When they beg him for information, he tells him that uh, basically Sandra invited him back to the help set up her new webcam. Dylan and his friends enlist Brady to follow through on his promise, pressuring him into installing spyware on her computer, intending to hack into her webcam in the hopes of seeing her nude. So, I, I mean... I, I ranked as one, of course. Uh, part of it is because, of course, you know, our friend Emily's in it, but also because I feel like this was such a, like, a this was like as growing up, who didn't want to have a stunningly gorgeous woman across the street from them <laughs> that they could look at, you know, as a as a teenager, right? I mean, it, it's very realistic. I mean, granted, it gets to a, a, a horribly, uh, uh, you know, intrusive level. Yeah. <laughs> um, what I love, though, is that it kind of gets so bonkers because it gets so creepy from, like, the their point of view, the kids, because they're being doing something so horrible. But then, like, you, the last thing you expect is from... <laughs> <laughs> like part of me like ex like if i didn't know what was going to go on like i mean we we kind of knew a little bit ahead of time what was going to happen in that segment but um what i would like if i was watching that without any kind of knowledge i would expect her to just come back and like like be like a psychotic killer or something definitely did not expect her to become a gorgon you know yeah <laughs> like which which was super cool like as she, the, you know the cool makeup effect she had on and everything and it was just it was so great because you know you knew those kids were going to have to get the revenge upon them at some point but you know, so it's kind of funny. I just think it's so natural, this one, at some level up until that point. You know, it's like so obvious. Like, that's what rotten kids would do. They totally spy on their neighbor and try and see her naked. <laughs> yeah, this one is definitely the most fun. It's, it's um, again, this one reminded me of like a tell, sort of like a Tales from the Crypt episode, too. Uh, it, it just kind of, or like maybe like a creep show, like the series element segment. It, it kind of felt like that. So I really like this as well. I ranked it number two. Brian ranked it number one. I ranked my number one was the next segment, which is to Helen back on New Year's Eve, 1999 best friends and videographers, Nate and Troy have been hired by what is revealed to be a coven of witches. Their task is to film the witches performing a ritual where a woman named Kirsten volunteers to be offered as a vessel to a powerful demon known as Ukaban. Despite agreeing to film the ritual, Nate is notably skeptical of his clients and thinks that the ritual may be a prank. Uh, the witches performing the ritual tell the duo that while they call the Ukaban, they will not actually summon it until the stroke of midnight on the new millennium when the veil between earth and hell is at its thinnest. As the ritual begins, Fergus, an uninvited demon who has disrupted the coven's rituals before, makes his presence known. As the witches attempt to cast it out, Fergus grabs Nate and Troy and drags them underneath the witch's altar. As his camera goes, as Fergus retreating, Troy slowly discovers that he and Nate have been sent to hell. The only reason I rate this one higher is because the effects in this one are so bonkers. Like it's, it's obviously low budget, but at the same time, the the effects and stuff are so creative that it just it's this view of hell is just ridiculous. 
And then you have that lead actress, which I can't remember her name, that is so Gollum like in this. Oh, Melanie Stone. Yeah, yeah. She's so great in this one. It's just, it, this one's just bonkers. It's just completely off the wall crazy. And that's kind of why I rank this one slightly ahead of Emily's segment, although I loved Emily's segment. Um, but yeah, this one I just thought was, I, I just love the effects. Like some of the creatures, stupidly weird, crazy creature effects in this one just, uh, I, I really liked. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, this it was so, it cracks me up. The de- demon is named Fergus, but um, but yeah, no, but I loved uh, the, yeah, like Melanie Stone was great in this. She's totally like as Mabel. She she kind of like totally like just stole the segment from yeah. the moment she got in there, and it was it was so great too because she's like totally you could tell she was totally like cha- uh, channeling like Gollum, yeah, you know, with her like the way she was like walking and running around and speaking and everything and remember she was so great in deadstream also so yeah. she's like got some good horror cred yeah yeah melanie stone and that, that's why this one was just so silly and bizarre that i loved it and for once they ended on a really good segment yeah, yeah. this one was a really good i mean i ranked it my number one um brian ranked as number two so a very highly ranked segment to, to end this one and you know looking back on vhs 99 as a whole there really are no bad segments. I mean, even Ozzy's Dungeon, which I'd ranked last, it was actually a really good segment. So I was, I'm kind of surprised now that I go back and look at my actual overall rankings. I'm wondering if I rank, rank, maybe ranked it too low, but I, I'm not going to change them because, like I said, they're fluid. So we'll, we'll keep going. Yeah, yeah, and same. And but, but this one traditionally gets a lot of like ranked low. Like you don't see a lot of like good reviews on this yeah, one. Yeah, I don't, and I don't know why. I don't know why. I know because when I read I, back I'm over just, it, I'm going, "Wow, all of these were actually pretty darn good." So I don't know. I don't think I had any yeah. weak segments. Um, our last uh, one here is VHS eighty five, which came out last year. Um, we had uh, the wraparound total copy directed by David Bruckner, Dream Kill directed by Scott Derrickson. T-K-N-O-G-D, directed by Natasha Kermani. Uh, no Wake slash Ambrosia, directed by Mike P. Nelson. And God of Death, directed by Gigi Saul Guerrero. A synopsis. Unveiled through a made-for-TV documentary, Five Tales of Found Footage Horror emerges to take viewers on a terrifying journey into the grim underbelly of the 80s. Obviously, this being the most recent, I think, Brian, we I don't know if we got a screener or if we just waited for this one to come out. I can't remember... But I was super excited for this one. Oh my gosh! I remember like the minute I could watch it, I watched it, and uh, I was. Yeah, we did get a screener. Yeah, uh, we did get from Shutter on this yeah. one, and I I was super excited because we knew Jeff Whitmire, our, our buddy, uh, had the song, the close end credit song to this. Yeah, and then of course our, our our new new one of our newer friends, Chelsea Grant, was in this, which I didn't even realize until we watched it, and I'm like, oh my god, yeah. <laughs> there she is, kind of thing. And then you know, then of course we we you know we had her on recently um but like and i knew her from the scare packages before that and this and then when i spotted her on there i'm like oh my god i you know had no clue she was in this and then um you know so that it was you know and then of course she did frogman but so this these last two it's funny 99 and 85 totally have the sentimental like vote because we i feel like we know so many people as part yeah. of it <laughs> and our our rankings were not actually very far off we kind of flip-flopped a few but overall our rankings were fairly close yeah. on this one um, the first, the wraparound is a, it's kind of a weird wraparound because it kind of like threads through the whole thing, but it's about a, a narrator presenting a documentary on a team of scientists uh, studying a shape shifting being they named Rory, and it's it's kind of a very strange segment. Yeah. Um, but the first segment, I remember when I saw this, I was like completely flabbergasted at the effects of this one. It looks so real, disturbingly real disturbingly real um yeah so it's called no wake seven friends uh rob i'm just going to kind of summarize this rob anna jared anna's boyfriend drew robin kevin and kelly travel in an rv to a camp at a lake uh ignoring signs warning visitors to get swimming they enter the water on a boat while anna and jared stay behind while water skiing they are shot and killed by an unseen sniper on the shore this is where it gets really brutal i mean it seems very realistic how they're getting shot and stuff yeah. I, like, it really disturbed me when i first watched it um, moments later, Rob drew Robin, especially Chelsea Grant. Yes. Uh, <laughs> moments later, Rob drew Robin. The curves is the one that, Oh, <laughs> uh, moments later, Rob drew Robin and Kelly regain consciousness. Despite their fatal injuries, returning to shore, they find their RV has the Roman numeral for seven painted on it with blood. They also find Anna and Jared dead. The survivors conclude that the water in the lake has the ability to bring the dead back to life. And since they were the only ones in the group to go into the water, only they were resurrected. They decide to enact their revenge on their attackers as the segment ends. And what's funny is when I watch this, um back uh 
I had totally forgotten that it ends like in a cliffhanger and then resumes later in a different segment. And so uh, I was like, or it I ties to another segment, I should say. Um, but I totally, so I was like, I had to keep rewinding. I was like, what happened? Did I miss something? Like I got so confused and I, I realized because I was, it's been a while since I'd seen this um, that I would totally forgotten how these segments interweave. And that's kind of a cool thing about this one compared to some of the other VHSs is you have segments kind of weaving in and out uh, and kind of dropping off and then coming back, which I thought was kind of a cool trick but, uh, that this one did that's kind of different from all the other VHSs. Um, I ranked the segment number one just because the, the, the effects and stuff are so shocking and, and so good. Yeah, no, this one, of course, uh, you know, because, you know, one Chelsea Grant's in it, so it's going to automatically be, uh, like, you know, perk our ears up and eyes to for that. But also because it really was cool, like you said, like, like her, like her one was like, oh, my God, it was it was so disturbing to just see her jaw like hanging off and like the one guy's guts are hanging out. And and it's like it, it just gave this a really this like weird, realistic, nightmarish feeling. Like, you know, like, it's like almost like, a, it's like, and I, I don't know why something about it was just so, so well done. It was so authentic. I mean, obviously they got lucky. So we know like, you know, Chelsea, she has been in a number of found footage movies. Um, and so she's, she's got the found footage, like technique down pat, like she, like supernatural. And, and it's just, just overall, it was like, just so like freaky to think imagine like like it's almost like you have a dream you ever have a dream where you die in your dream but you know you're not you should be dead but you're still walking around yeah, in your dream yeah. kind of thing that's what i feel like they captured that somehow yeah and it was just so well done like you said and the, the i did not expect the level of gore so right off the bat on that kind of a of a story so yeah and the found footage like is perfect for that because it makes it seem so much more real especially when they're presenting it so really yeah. you can imagine what it'd be like to be on that boat getting shot at and watching your friends get shot at. it was really horrible um the next segment uh god of death i didn't really remember this one uh even though i'd watched this a year ago a mexican news crew is preparing for the morning news at uh, ahorita tv massive earthquake strikes during the broadcast which kills the entire crew except for the cameraman luis he's assisted out of the rubble by a rescue team they attempt to make their way out of the building but are blocked from exit is exiting by a fallen rubble uh, by, by fallen rubble a member of the rescue team javier is mortally wounded in aftershock and he forces one of his co-workers carla to expedite his death carla luis and two other men in the group miguel and eddie make their way through a crawl space where they enter a room with walls made of skulls and a statue of an ancient aztec god named mictian which i thought so this one is interesting it was ranked uh, you ranked a five i ranked a four um, I think this is just a circumstantial one because it wasn't a bad segment. No. And it, like, I, I, I felt like it, like it, it took a little too long to get to the reveal at the end. Yeah, but not by much. By much, it was, it was, it was just a little bit too long. I think leading up to it, but I think they just wanted to establish it and help the surprise. Yeah. at the ending, a little bit different, but it was definitely a cool end, way to end it. Yeah, I just I, this one, like I said, I, I, just, I didn't didn't really remember this one even though i watched this a year ago it's one of the most least memorable segments of the whole movie for me so that's the only reason i ranked it as low as it was but it's not a bad segment um the next one up is tknogd a performance artist ada lovelace opens a show for a small audience in a theater she explains that the world has killed god and replaced him with the god of technology she introduces a video of a demonstration of a virtual reality software device that allows its user to exist simultaneously on the physical and digital plane um, I also ranked this one low. I ranked it number four. Brian ranked it number five. Uh, it's it, it's it's a confusing segment where it's placed. Like it came out of nowhere, and I wasn't sh even sure if it wasn't part of like the wraparound or something. And um, it's got it's got a weird tone to it. Like it's there's like a bit of humor in it. In that um, you know, obviously this takes place during '85. This whole movie uh, takes place in the '80s, and so you have this uh, technology guy demonstrating these um this vr device which he calls uh iphones it's like headphones but he calls them iphones and it's kind of like a comedic play on the iphone existing before before that take which is kind of funny but then the rest of the segment's not really that funny it's like more of a i don't know it, it, when when uh ada ends up getting killed by this demonic entity in the vr world I don't know. I just found it kind of confusing and tonally kind of weirdly all over the place. 
And I kind of felt like this segment, I've kind of felt like one of those audience members trapped in this presentation <laughs> that she was doing yeah. and not having a very good time of it. So uh, yeah, this one definitely my, I, I could actually, I think in hindsight, I would rank this one number five and move God of Death up to number four. I think I would have agreed with you, Brian. In hindsight, I think the only reason I had ranked it number four initially was because I did kind of like the VR and the iPhones uh, pun thing, but I don't know. Maybe the more I think about it, it probably should have been dead last. Yeah, this at least thank God they put this in the middle where it belongs. So because I think this one, I, I bet you some people like the segment. Um, I did not. I thought it was I just was bored, honestly. So it's fine that it was in the middle because it did like it was easily kind of forgettable at the same time. <laughs> so it's yeah. like yeah. yeah, I just was not, this one was not for me. Let's put it that way. We'll use our, our little, yes. our slogan <laughs> in our group yeah. there when uh, we don't like something. It's, it wasn't for me. So was it for us? Yeah. Uh, next one is Ambrosia, which is, um, this is the one that ties in with the original segment. No way, which was cool because VHS hadn't really done that that way without a wraparound segment kind of thing. So I kind of liked how they yeah. did this. Um, so it's the Wrigley family are hosting a celebration in honor of their teenage daughter, Ruth, who films the occasion with her cousin, James. Ruth's young relative, Adam, shoots her with a water gun, which he reveals was given to him by a lady in an RV that is seen speeding off. That evening, the Wrigleys reveal they are celebrating an old family tradition, the murders of seven people as a rite of passage that Ruth has completed. Now, I like this segment a lot on its own. The fact that it connected yeah. to the first one also and was a complete story was awesome. Yeah, it, and this one is another one that it uses the same. It's kind of got that same violent, realistic feel as the first segment. Like it kind of ties right in. Like it feels real, and they're like shooting each other and stuff. But uh, yeah, that one's uh, that one again was a favorite. Of mine. I ranked it number three, uh, only because I ranked the next segment segment a little higher. And Brian reversed it. He ranked this one number two and ranked the segment I ranked number two as number three. So we kind of flip flopped. Yeah. Um, but yeah, this one was a great. Yeah, this one too could have is kind of reminds me a little Twilight Zone ish Tales from the Crypt -y with that revenge ending kind of thing where like like the tables get turned on the person and they're gonna suffer this uh, like a horrible fate. Kind of like that one. Do you remember that um I believe it was an Alfred Hitchcock presents. I think we discussed this one where there was a guy and he was in prison and he found a way to get out of prison by getting himself he made friends with this old guy that was the one that would take all the dead prisoners out. And so he made a deal with him. He's like, mm -hmm. I'm going to pretend I'm dead. I'm going to take this thing. I'm going to pretend I'm dead. I'm going to get in the coffin and then I'm going to get you. You can take me out. I remember he woke up and realized he sees the, the guy that was going to get him out is dead in there with yeah. him. So yeah. it's like, it was like one of those endings that kind of reminded me of that, like that twist ending that like was, um, that was like the revenge on the person who's like deserves it kind of thing. Yeah. It's kind of cool. Yeah. So I like that. Yeah, definitely. Um, next up, the last one here is dream kill in the point of view. The killer enters a woman's home, ties her up and brutally murders her while she's on the phone with 911. The lead detective Wayne recognizes the scene from a previous video of a similar murder. Another video shows the killer entering another home, fighting the man inside and brutally murdering him as well. The police come to the house and Wayne tells Bobby that he had already seen the murder on tape. He received earlier. Wayne investigates and finds out that Gunter, Bobby's son is the one sending the tapes. Gunter claims that he saw the murders in his dreams and they were being recorded on the tapes. He sent them to the police to warn them. I ranked this one number two. And the reason I ranked it number two is because I thought it was so creepily done. It's It's got this very gritty film feel to it of the killer's point of view. It is very dreamlike. I, I liked how they made it like a dreamy effect. But it looks so realistic. It looks like one of those seventies serial killer documentaries. Yeah. And if the serial killer had actually filmed him killing these people and it was, it was very well done. And the soundtrack, this is one of the main reasons I, I thought this was so creepy. The, so the soundtrack, if you don't know, uses a song called hamburger lady by a band called throbbing gristle and throbbing gristle was a, like a seventies band that did uh, no, basically noise art music and a lot of creepy stuff and like really avant-garde crazy type of music and the, i first heard this song on a twitch stream that i listened to called vinyl junkies um that this is a guy that owns ten thousand records his name is sam he does this twitch stream called vinyl junkies and he has he just plays vinyl records I and mean, he plays records and he talks about them and he knows all about them because he's been collecting for 50 years and he played uh hamburger lady off 
one of Throbbing Gristle's albums, and it was the scariest song I've ever heard in my life. Like it disturbed me on a big level. Like it was a scary, scary song, and they used that in this segment, and that's why I think another reason why it got so under my skin. But uh, super, super creepy. Like you couldn't ask for a better soundtrack to a segment. It, this one just terrified me, and that's why I ranked it number two uh, behind No Wake because. I just was completely creeped out by this segment. It does lose some of the steam when it when it gets to the like police interrogation stuff. Like it kind of loses some of the creep factor. But those first opening segments are brilliant. Yeah, and this one's got some star power. You got James Ransom in there, which is obviously a Scott Derrickson uh, favorite there. Yeah. Um, after the Black Phone, and so it, I I think it was um. Yeah, this is what I think the kind of segment you'll get from uh, from these series when you get like a really like good director, tr- like already is established coming in. So it's like it's almost like a reverse of the original one. So it's kind of like a neat way to have a, you know, to, to end this to end this this film with a, like a really solid thing that could have been honestly could have been a, a, a feature length if you think about it, that kind of plot point um yeah so yeah. and it was just a really good story and it, it, you know it, it, there's a little bit of tales from the crypty kind of thing in there too if you think about it but still it's just what it's just overall it was like yeah i think it was a really solid way and a second one in a row that ended strongly finally you know it's like they finally were getting it now like hey we need to end these yeah. strong yeah. <laughs> yeah you know what it reminded me of now that i think about it it reminded me of the home videos and sinister oh yeah remember, yes remember yes, how yes. creepy those were that's what it reminded me. You're of. right. That's what yeah. it, I think that's why it was so effective. Now that you said yeah. that, yes, that's right. We never, we never did the sinister movies. We need to put yeah, those on I there. So I need to. I need to revisit those. I we'll think it's on my uh, Voodoo for you. So I think I have them in there. Yeah. So um, that was uh, VHS 85, which was the most recent entry until the new one comes out in October. So we got to talk about our rankings of how we rank all these. And again, I, this was kind of off the cuff. I just. I just plopped them down uh, in the way I thought. And actually, we came out pretty close. Yeah. Uh, at least our bottom our bottom three were identical. Yeah. Um, and then we kind of had some. We, one we and three are the only ones different, three. I think. That's it. I think one yeah, and three right. are the only one ones. And th- we we, we flip flopped one and three. Um, so well, I think we'll start at the bottom because yeah. we agreed on the bottom. We, we both agreed VHS Viral was the, the worst of them. Yeah. Much. Um, again, like I said, none of these are bad. All of these yeah. are worth your time. I would, I would watch any of these over in place of some of the more terrible horror movies I've watched. Yeah. So I mean, you know, I, are, I are had, definitely. I had so much fun rewatching all these again. I did too. I did too. I like, I binged these and like, because Brian can tell you, I was, I was kind of like messed up our schedule because I had not had time to watch these over the July Fourth weekend. And so I really had a limited time to rewatch them. Um, I had think maybe three days and I ended up watching all of them in two days. Like I just binged this whole series because I, and I, and I had a great time doing it. It never felt like work. Like, yeah. I was having a ball. Yeah. Day. I, I, cause I, cause um, I hadn't seen the first three in a while. So it was really fun to rewatch those yeah. again. And just overall, yeah. like it's just a great series. It's by far one of the best yeah. franchises out there. So, yeah. So yeah, number six, VHS viral. Number five, we had VHS 85. Um, I had this one at fifth place. Again, sometimes they just land there by default. Yeah, I, you know, like uh, but I do. I was wanted it higher, but I just couldn't find it there. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's like it, it was. It was, I honestly feel like VHS 85 probably d- doesn't deserve to be number five. But at the same time, there's no other place I could put it. There really isn't because the other ones I like just slightly more. Not that it really has any weak segments again, but you just have to kind of look at it as the overall whole. And and anthologies are always hard to rank for me because some segments you might really like yeah. they are surrounded by filler, or you might have sub segments that are, uh, you know, where do you rank that when that one segment you really love doesn't, the rest of the movie maybe doesn't hold up. So I don't know. Uh, it, it's tough. Uh, number four, we both had VHS 99. Um, I think between 94 and 99, 99 is definitely the inferior of, of the two. But uh, yeah, I think it's, I think I, overall I liked it better than 85. Yeah. I, I mean, I, again, I wish that could be higher. It's just, it's hard because when you have such a good series, something's going to have to be first and something's going to have to be down at the bottom. Doesn't mean it's, it's bad. It just, yeah. I mean, we, we always say this. I mean, people have to understand when you do any kind of ranking, it's not like you're ranking it like, 
on the world stage here. We're just ranking six great movies, and they got to be in some quarter. You can't all make them all tied. <laughs> what would be the point? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So. All right, so here's where we start to differ. Um, number three, I had the original VHS. Um, not because I think it necessarily deserves number three in terms of quality, because uh, I really like it more than what you would consider a third place finish, but I just happen to like the other two movies more. Uh, and uh, in my mind, it was, I think VHS 2 goes above it uh, in my rankings only because of the uh, safe haven segment, which was so phenomenal. Um, but again, on any given day, these these might be able to flip flop. But I had VHS at number three. Yeah, and that's why I had ninety four there because, um, and, and, you know, and I'll explain. Obviously, that means one and two are going to be in, in the the first two for me. And I mean, I, I've explained my rankings on when franchises before. Usually, the the first movie in the franchise because it starts the franchise always is going to start in that top spot and it's its job to stay there if that makes sense you know it's mm -hmm. like it's it's your job to number one there you're you're the opening you're there to lose it and i so that's why number four could have easily been up there but the first two were really strong so i felt i don't know i just felt like not right putting 94 like ahead of the first two but it's a it's close. Like I mean, one and one, two and three are extremely like I mean, like fractionally close, kind of thing. Like it would need a photo finish. <laughs> we both kind of ended up with VHS two as our second place, which I'm kind of surprised because a lot of I went out and looked at a lot of rankings after I did my ranking. I didn't do it before. After I did my ranking, I went and looked at some of the VHS ranked uh, articles, and a lot of people have VHS two as their number one primarily on the strength of safe haven yeah, which i, I can safe understand haven is, but i don't, I don't yeah. but I, I don't like propping up a movie just because of one segment um in this case it did get really high because i think all the segments are strong in vhs2 um and i thought it was overall better than the original um that's why i got number 2 i ended up putting vhs94 as my number 1 and i think a large part of that not only because it's a great movie but because it left such an impact on me after VHS viral when it came back and it brought yeah. the franchise back and it was so exciting and it was, and it was actually good. And I think that just made a big impression on me. You know, I don't, I don't know that if there had been that gap between these, if I necessarily may have ranked it as high, uh, you know, if it'd come out in 2015 or something uh, or whatever, uh, right after VHS viral, I don't know that it would have had the same impact, but after that long absence coming back and still being so quality, I think maybe elevated it a little higher than than maybe it might have otherwise. But so I have, yeah, I have VHS ninety four as my number one. I've seen other rankings rank it as number two behind VHS two. Um, I, I I put it above VHS two only because it it had more segments and and also uh, all hell right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I and so I yeah, we had I had VH2 uh VHS2 with 2 and but I had the original one like I said my thoughts but, but it's funny cuz your kind of reason for 94 is kind of this on the same wavelength as why I why I make the first one because for you it was that 94 was such a strong uh resurgence for you where as mm -hmm. you know and I'm like and I'm kind of keeping I kept it like that's why it was still in the third for me and the first one for me just because it like it introduced me to the series that I like absolutely love it had really good segments in it and it was you know it, it also captured that feeling that like I was like of like okay this is it basically changed the way I looked at found footage again like it it like found footage to me it like evolves constantly I feel like like, I feel like it's still evolving to this day. And it basically, so when I first saw that, it basically took two of my favorite subgenres, found footage and anthologies, and put them together and blew me away. And I'm like, okay, I, you know, so it's like, it was always going to be, like I said, it was always going to be there. It had to lose that spot. And I, as even though some of the great, you know, the other ones were all great too, and in, in their own right, I feel like it had to like stay there in, in the number one spot for me. But like I said, it's like fractionally two and ninety four come right after it, you know. Yeah, I can't, I can't argue against that reasoning. I mean, I could easily see why it would be in the number one spot 
again, like on any given day, ask me, <laughs> ask yeah. me, and I might change my mind with these. But uh, I think viral is the only one that's going to stay where it is. <laughs> yeah, that would stay where it is. And poor um, Dante the Great. Yeah, you know, like I feel bad. Uh, I feel he deserved he, to be in a better, he, better movie. <laughs> he should have should have moved to a different movie. That's what um, we should have done. We oh, we should have made. Maybe we'll revisit this. We'll give it some time. We'll revisit it when we do the new VHS, and we'll redo our rankings anyway. And maybe like take all the segments and reorder them for their own movies, and see if we can come up with yes. a better way to do that. I think that'd be fun. I like we could make the ultimate VHS movie by doing the best segments of each one. Yeah, put them in one movie. That would be awesome. But then, but then we, we got to be careful not to leave like like a total dud one out there, like. Like via just garbage or something and have it like all the worst segments of it. But like I feel like yeah. we could like if we rearrange it, like maybe we should almost do two ways. Like one, take each one and rearrange the segments, and then do another one where we maybe swap segments to maybe blend in with each other better. Like just a whole revisit, like yeah. a whole remaster like thing. I cause I think like that might be re- fun. Yeah, remix. You know? VHS we'll call it VHS remix. Yes. Oh which you know is gonna be a f- future title. I'll yeah, tell you though, yeah. with if this, I swear to God, I will blow a gasket if this series makes one called VHS Bloodlines. I will not stand for that. <laughs> <laughs> no, we cannot have we that. We cannot have that. So it just doesn't make any sense. But VHS Remix oh, actually sounds God. great. Yeah, that sounds cool. You know, it'd be so much so cool if when this series we know is done for good, someone just puts it on one disc and you can hit randomize and you don't know which segment you're going to get. And that call that VHS Remix. That would be yeah, cool. Yeah, that would be cool. Yeah. yeah. So you guys let us know what your rankings are with yeah. these um, and tell us what you think. Shoot us a line at our Civil War podcast at gmail.com address or hit us up on Twitter or Instagram or Facebook and uh, let us know what you think. Uh, we will be continuing our summer location. I'm not going to reveal what it is yet because I, I let the cat out of the bag too bit too quickly on VHS. So I'm not going to tell you what our next franchise is. We'll, we'll throw some teasers out there uh, after this episode drops uh, with our next franchise and we will see you back here next week with our continued summer slaycation. I am ejecting the VHS from the the uh, the VCR as we speak, so we can move on to our next franchise. Yeah, just be kind and rewind, Brian. Yes, I, I always do. I worked at a video store. I know. <laughs> <laughs> See you guys. <laughs>